Hello and welcome back to Physics 123, Quantum Mechanics 1. So we are now on the third chapter of this course. So in this chapter, we will generalize or formalize, formalize the concepts in quantum mechanics. So before we proceed with the first lesson, let's first review what we have discussed so far in this course. So let's review again the two constructs or postulates of quantum mechanics. So we have the wave function, which represents the state of a system. So the, the system could be in the ground state or it could be in the excited states. <clears throat> and then the second postulate, which is the operator. So the operator actually represents the physical quantities or the physical observables. Examples of that are position, momentum, and energy. And these operators or the operators acts or operates on the wave function. As an example of that, we have uh, encountered the time-independent Schrodinger equation where the operator H the total energy operator, also called the Hamiltonian, acts on our wave function. And this results in finding the energy eigenvalue. So this is an eigenvalue equation from your mathematical uh, physics. So the first lesson for this chapter is an introduction to uh, the formalisms in quantum mechanics and we will first discuss the Hilbert space and its relation to the wave function. So the Hilbert space as may, you may have encountered in your mathematical physics is the space is the space where quantum mechanical vectors uh, live so essentially this is the home of your wave functions and it's basically the set of all square integrable functions when you say square integrable functions it means that if you square the function absolute value square of the function and then you integrate it the value of that integral must not be infinite or the value of that integral must be finite in the case of quantum mechanical vectors or wave functions the value of this integral must be greater than or equal to zero so wave functions again are represent the state of the system and in Hilbert space, they are actually uh, vectors. They are vectors in Hilbert uh, space. So in an n-dimensional uh, space, a vector can be represented as a one uh, or as a column uh, matrix, a one column matrix. And this notation is usually what we call a ket notation or a ket uh, vector. So there's the ket. The partner of the ket is the bra. And you have the bracket notation. So for instance, uh, the position vector x i hat or x x hat plus y y hat plus z. Uh, sorry, I forget. It should be. Okay, it should be z hat. So we're not using i, j, k here, but x, y, and z hat unit vectors. So we can actually write these position vectors in terms of the ket uh, notation as like this. So this is your possession, position, not possession, position vector. And it's represented by this column matrix with elements x, y, and z, which represents the components x, y, and z components of your vectors. 
So if you take the adjoint of a cat vector or adjoint of a Coulomb matrix, you will get the uh, bra. So this is not the n-dimensional bra vector. Again, from your mathematical physics, adjoint means transpose plus conjugate. So you take the transpose, the rows becomes columns, the columns becomes rows, and then you take the complex conjugate. So in general, the adjoint of the bra is the ket, and the adjoint of the ket is the bra vector. So this notation is formally known as the Dirac notation. So Dirac was the one was the first to use this notation. So sometimes it's also called the bracket notation. The bra represents uh, row matrices. The ket represents Coulomb matrices. So one property of uh, vectors is the inner product. So you may have encountered this in your basic physics as the dot product but that is just the dot product is just a very specific uh, scenario or specific application so the dot product between two vectors an inner uh, a bra and a cat so you can only have an inner product between a bra vector and a cat vector such as they form a bracket so that's the inner product so the bra is represented by this row matrix, row matrix here. Again, if uh, you have a bra vector, all of its uh, elements are conjugated. You take the complex conjugate. And for the ket vector, G, uh, it's a Coulomb matrix. So based on the rules of matrix multiplication, so this multiplication of matrices here is just F1 conjugate G1 and then F2 conjugate G2 until Fn conjugate Gn. Or they are neatly summarized by this uh, uh, summation here. Fi, G, Fi conjugate Gi. But this is only true for discrete uh, values or discrete elements. If your two functions, F and G, or these two vectors are discrete, essentially. And this is basically your formula for the dot product. A dot B is equal to A B cosine theta. That, uh, that uh, lesson. In the event that your functions are continuous functions, then the dot product is represented by this uh, integral. Or the inner product. Sorry, this is no longer the dot product. The dot product, again, is just a special case. So this is formally known as the inner product. So the inner product between two continuous functions is that this is the integral of f conjugate g and integrated over whatever uh, whatever variable so for instance x so these are the two uh, definitions of inner product so what are the properties of inner product so one <coughs> if you reverse the positions of your vectors then uh, the dot product between g and f is just the dot product of f and g conjugate so if you reverse the operation uh, you need to take the conjugate second property is the dot product of a vector with itself so from this uh, notation here if f and this is also f and this is also f so f conjugate f is just the absolute value of f squared and this is always greater than or equal to zero so our wave functions satisfy this uh, condition that that product of itself is greater than or equal to zero it's it cannot be negative because this is basically the definition of the magnitude of a vector this is how you calculate the magnitude of a vector right you you take the dot product of the vector with itself and that will give you the magnitude squared of that vector so that is always positive greater than or equal to zero and our wave function wave functions share that same uh, property so this this only means that the inner product 
of our functions are real. They produce real values. So a third property is the orthonormality property or the orthonormality condition. So the dot product between two or the inner product between two uh, vectors, state vectors, Fm and Fn is given by this. So it's the Kronecker delta Mn. So the value of this is either 1 or 0. 1 if if, it, if it's an inner product with itself. 0 if it's an inner product with other uh, vectors in the space. So orthonormality condition. So this means that the our wave vectors are perpendicular, mutually perpendicular to each other. Just like the unit vectors, i hat, j hat, and k hat. i dot j is uh, 0. i dot k is 0. Because they are their angle, the angle between them is 90 degrees, or they are, they are all mutually perpendicular. So, orthonormal. So, they are, so, essentially just unit vectors. Unit vectors are normalized, meaning their length is 1. They are also orthogonal with each other. So, in, 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 essentially they are orthonormal. Orthogonal, perpendicular, and normal, meaning 1 unit. Their length, their lengths are 1 unit. Also, uh, these uh, functions or vectors form a complete set, meaning any function can be uh, represented as a linear combination of other functions in the space or in the Hilbert space. So, we by now you must have uh, you must be familiar with how to get C here, the linear combination coefficient. Just multiply both sides by Fm conjugate and then integrate, Fm conjugate and integrate. So basically, you get an inner product. So <clears throat> to get Cn, basically you get this one. You multiply both sides by Fm conjugate and then integrate. So only one term again in the summation will survive. N is equal to M. So you get this. Or in a short notation and direct notation, this is just the inner product of the Fn unit vector, the state vector, times your original function. So usually in we have encountered this. Usually this is our psi ns, our uh, stationary state vectors, and f here is our initial wave function, psi x of psi x zero. Okay. So this is what we call the Fourier trick in how to achieve this or how to solve the linear combination coefficients. So let's have a simple example. Okay. So for what V is the function F equal to X of V x to the v rather in Hilbert space in the interval 0 to 1 okay so the definition if your function is in Hilbert space Hilbert Hilbert space is if the inner product with itself should be greater than or equal to 0 so that's the that's our condition so again, this is uh, this can also be represented by an integral. So the integral form of this is absolute value of f squared dx. So this must be greater than or equal to zero. This must be positive in order for it to be in Hilbert space. Uh, we are given the interval here. So for what v is it is this function in Hilbert space? In this interval 0 to 1. So this will be our limits. Okay. <clears throat> so the integral of this from 0 to 1 of our function squared. So x to the v squared is just x to the 2v dx. So this will give us uh, x to the 2v plus 1 over 2v plus 1 <coughs> evaluated 
from 0 to 1. <coughs> so, so, in the upper limit, <coughs> you have 1 to the 2v, 1 to the 2v is 1. No, we're finding v. So, 1 to the 2v plus 1 over 2v plus 1 minus the lower limit, you have 0 to the 2v plus 1 over 2v plus 1. So, this will give us 1. So, 1 to the 2v plus 1 is just 1. So, minus 0 to the 2v plus 1 all over 2v plus 1. And this should be greater than or equal to 0. So, which means that, so the denominator doesn't matter. So, the numerator only matters. So, we mean, this means that 1 or 0 to the bit. This, this further implies that 0 to the 2v plus 1 must be, you transpose it to the other side, the equation must be less than or equal to uh, 1. <coughs> so this further implies that 2v plus 1 must be positive. Because if this is negative, you have 1 over 0. So 2v plus 1 must be uh, greater than 0. And you will have uh, V must be, sorry, greater than uh, negative 1 half. If you transpose uh, 1, it becomes negative 1. So, for what V? That is the answer. So, V must be greater than negative 1 half. So, if v is less than negative one half then your function here x to the v will no longer be in hilbert space okay uh, for v is equal exactly equal to one half is f of x in hilbert uh, space so obviously yes because the condition should be v is greater than negative one half and v is equal to 1 half is definitely greater than negative 1 half. So yes, f of x is still in Hilbert uh, space. So how about, okay, how about f of x and the derivative of f with respect to x, df dx, are they in Hilbert space? Okay, so how about x, f, and the derivative. So, x, f, f of x, in this case, will just be x times x to the v. So, basically, you have x to the v plus 1. So, you're essentially asking is x to the power of v plus 1 in Hilbert space for the specific case of v is equal to 1 half. So, for v is equal to 1 half, you will have x to the three halves. So, based on our result in the pre previous, ano, V must be greater than uh, negative one half, or the power of X should be greater than negative one half. So, in this case, three halves is definitely greater than negative one half. So, yes, this function is still in Hilbert space. How about the derivative of F with respect to X? So, if you take the derivative of that, you have V the x to the v minus 1 and if, if you evaluate this at uh, v is equal to 1 half so you will get 1 half x to the 1 half minus 1 so negative 1 half x to the negative 1 half okay so the power of x here is now negative 1 half so this is actually our v our new v and does it satisfy this condition that v must be greater than negative one half 
So no, it's exactly equal to negative one half. So the answer, this will be no. So this function, the derivative of f with respect to x is no longer in infinite space, but x multiplied by our function f is still in Hilbert space in the interval 0 to 1. So basically that's how you check your if your function is in Hilbert space or not. So you just uh, you use the this condition. So the function Again, this means the function is square integrable. And the value of its square square and then integral must be positive. So that's how we define the functions in Hilbert space. So basically that's the end of this lesson. So that is just the introduction for this chapter. So I will see you again in the next chapter.